Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind. And today, after many, many months of attempting on my part, we finally have the wonderful Dr. Ruth Fletcher, who is president and head of school, head of head of school at the St. Andrews Schools. And um, you know, Ruth, it's such a pleasure to see you. And I know before you became, you know, president and head of school, that you held very uh, uh, an assortment of um, administrative positions at Punahou School, and also you had worked with the University of Hawaii in their um, program to train administrators, and so you've had quite a varied career. Um, but the first uh, question I have for you is, could you explain this uh, um, St. Andrew's Schools to me? Uh, I think you had a, you, you know, I, I think I understand it, but I want to make sure that I get it accurately uh, for this program. So what, what does it mean that the, you are the head of the St. Andrew's Schools and Schools is plural? Uh, thank you for asking. So we have a very uh, interesting dynamic at our school. We, we're preschool through 12. So Queen Emma Preschool is part of our uh, one of our schools. And then we have the Priory, which is an all-girls school, K-12. to And then we have the Prep, which is a K-6 to all-boys school. And the Boys School, the, pe the Prep, and the Priory are on our downtown campus uh, at Queen Emma Square. And then Queen Emma Preschool is up in New Uanu on the Poly Highway. So I'm going to ask you, um, you know, uh, uh, a question first, and I'll, we'll get to other issues. But you know, what makes your school so special? And I and I ask this because you know my wife is acquainted with your school, and she um, is the uh, drama teacher there. Um, you know, she's part time <laughs> because we're both retired. But you know, she comes back with stories about the wonders of your of your girls. Now I'm talking about high school girls. So. What what is it that makes you know um, St. Andrews uh, a gem, as I've coined in the title of this program? Uh, the way I look at it is, we are um, firmly grounded in our heritage, our Hawaiian heritage, and our Episcopal heritage. So there is an abundance of loving kindness on our campus. And so when you start learning as a young child, and you feel loved and supported, and you feel um, just cared by people, then you can thrive. And so that's in our DNA and it's always been here. I think this year we're over 100, you know, we're over 150 years old and Queen Emma was known as the people's queen and she brought the Anglican church to Hawaii. So here, what I would say is that we know how to perpetuate the Aloha spirit in its very, very depths because of uh, the courage of Queen Emma and her compassion and her loving kindness. So they're integral to how we live our lives here and the values of Aloha, Malama, and Kuleana kind of rise to the top. But our goal is that every student that ever attends St. Andrews is Pono, meaning they know and do the right thing because they want to be, they want to leave the world a little bit better than they found it. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna quote here from a, when a, someone that I knew when I was quite young, um, a guy named Jerry Shore, who said, you know, the goal in life is just just to be a kind person, just be kind. But I noticed in your vision statement, and I, you know, vision and mission statements are a dime a dozen. If you compare them for private schools in, uh, in the United States, they all appear uh, quite similar. Yours does not, however because you want to make sure that all your girls and your boys K through six are humane that that you know and, and and what do you what do you mean by that and how do you instill that in your students at St Andrews Priory uh, you know Ruth I um, or Dr. Fletcher um, you know I look at vision statements and mission statements from private schools across the country and of course I did this with Boyle and um, getting to know a lot of different independent schools and Episcopal schools and parish schools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and most of them appear quite similar, um, but yours really mentions a couple things uh, for kids to be just and kids to be humane. And I'm wondering um, how you came to this and um, you know, it may have occurred before you uh, became out of school, um, but um, why, how, how is that exemplified in your students and, and what are you trying to do? Because of course, this is all in relationship to the girls community or the, uh, the K through six boys community. So the way I came to that is I, I truly believe in a humanistic education that 
we are all human. And for us to really thrive as people, you have to understand your emotions, you have to um, be safe, and you have to have someone care for you. And that's your foundation. And so if you can build a foundation where love and care and respect and worth and dignity are at the center of how the school operates, then children can find their own voice, they can explore, they can take risks, and they can self-actualize and find their own potential. The thing about that is you have to also strive for excellence because you can be a very good person, but not necessarily try to get better and improve. So coupling this humane education that's really focused on our humanity and then striving for excellence in education means that we're really after reach, helping every child reach their full potential so that they can do something that's worthwhile for the world. And, you know, as part of this, um, you have already mentioned this in this interview, is you talk about Queen Emma's um, legacy. And of course, you know, <laughs> part of that legacy is a hospital that we all know about and that where people cannot be refused treatment, which is, you know, some legacy, just that by itself. But how do you see um, in your position carrying on um, through the school, through its curriculum, through through staff, et cetera, et cetera? How, how are you fulfilling uh, Queen Emma's legacy? Uh, basically, we're trying to put out into the world good, competent people so that they are, they understand civility, they understand what it means to be humane and just, so that they can enter open-mindedly into conversations and have civil dialogue. They can invest the, investigate the world, be curious about it, uh, and then communicate their ideas well, uh, take on multiple perspectives. But the most important thing um, from my view, is that they have to do something. They have to take an action. They have all this knowledge, but then what are they going to do about it? What are they going to do about a problem that they want to solve? And so the action is key. Yeah, that, that's wonderful. Um, and, uh, you know, I really appreciate the, no, the notion of sort of like uh, knowledge and action. So that's, that's really <laughs> great. Um, now, your school is a, is a very interesting one because from my understanding, and you correct me if I'm wrong, you are not an independent school, but you were part of the Episcopal Church. Uh, um, but but let me ask, I'm going to stop there because I want you to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we are an independent school. We are part oh, okay. of the National Association of Independent Schools. We are separately incorporated, um, from, uh, but we are under the umbrella of the Episcopal Church of Hawaii, and we have a memorandum of agreement with them because we sit on their land. Yeah, that's well that's that's important that you have an agreement with it's, them. It's huge. We're very <laughs> grateful. We're very and, grateful to have the land we sit on. You know, and I, I know that you know, um and your girls do go to Episcopal Church. Is that correct? Yes. Each each everyone does. Um every cycle, every weekend, the girls and the boys and our preschoolers have chapel. So let me ask you, you know, I've asked you about Queen Emma, so let me ask you about the Episcopal Church. How do you see um the Episcopal Church or Episcopal theology? playing a role in your schools. Um, and uh, let me preface this by saying, not very far from where you are is Father Dutille's IHS, the Peter Butter Ministry, which is probably the greatest example of any congregation, Christian, Buddhist, Jewish, Muslim, of someone who did something miraculous in terms of dealing with the homeless problem, pro, uh, issue, not a problem, issue. Um, Father Dutil. So how do you see the Episcopal Church and Episcopal theology playing a role in your curriculum and in your school? You know, it's fascinating uh, that when you are an Episcopalian or you agree or you take the covenant that you respect the worth and dignity of each individual and you will help the world become more humane and just. So just by saying yes to that covenant, uh, that's how we educate and that is part of our mission. So I often see uh, Queen Emma, who brought the Episcopal, the Anglican Church then at the time, to Hawaii, is that they they actually fell in love with one another. <laughs> and, and so when we, our school, kind of radiates Episcopalian and Hawaiian culture seamlessly and woven together, and it's really about helping the world be more humane and just and then acknowledging the gifts and talents that are um, inherent in each individual that is on the planet. So um, you know, I'm going to ask you another question. You know, 
we have a legacy in Hawaii of having, you know, Bishop Kennedy's, mm -hmm. uh, Bishop Browning's, and, you know, the Bishop Browning went on and became the head of the Episcopal Church in the entire United States. So what's your relationship like the bishop here in Hawaii? And is that the main Episcopal representative that you deal with um, um, often? And I imagine that you do see him because you're at St. Andrews, that wonderful cathedral. So um, Bishop Bob Fitzpatrick is the bishop right now of uh, in Hawaii and Micronesia and the Pacific Islands. And so he's on our board. He's our liaison to um, from the board and the school to the Episcopal Church of Hawaii. And he's wonderful. Uh, he very much helps us. Uh, he's been a very strong supporter of the school. And so I see him at least once a month. <laughs> and if I see him more, then that's probably not a good thing. <laughs> But he's uh, he's very helpful, and he also is. Um, we also have a chaplain. We have um, a chaplain at the school. Her name is um, Reverend Heather Patton Graham, and so she does our um, chapels each week. But the the bishop is actually very much involved in the school. So he does our uh, convocation. He comes to our our Christmas celebration, our Easter celebration. And then every year, um, our school was founded on Ascension Day. And so there's a big, huge celebration on Ascension Day that has a service. And then the juniors decorate a coral cross that is here on campus with um, almost 3,000 carnations. I might even have the number wrong, but anyway, they um, decorate it and it is a kind of a gift to the school and a gift of the juniors to the seniors as they're celebrating their life going forward after they graduate from the Priory. Our major celebrations are often uh, coupled with religious holidays. So I see the bishop a lot and, and it works out very well for me. <laughs> so. that, that's wonderful. So, you know, um, when you're, uh, when I first arrived in Hawaii, which was in 1980, I uh, was teaching at Iolani School, which was a very small school at that point. Um, it's much larger now. But what was nice about having a small school was that you only had a, you, know, you had a small class, class sizes. And I know you have that also at um, um, St. Andrew's schools. What are the advantages and, and perhaps disadvantages um, of having, um, you know, small amounts of students in a class, you know, an overall class, and, um, and uh, you know, what's good about it for learning purposes? For learning purposes, uh, you're known. You're known, you're understood, you're heard, your voice is heard, uh, and you can't hide. Um, that's also the downside <clears throat> because some kids would like to hide. Um, so I, I graduated from a class of over a thousand. So my small setting was always in sports. But what I would say is that the, the advantage of a small classroom when you're learning and learning for the first time in your first introduction to school. And if you can create strong friendships, a sense of belonging, and kind of this camaraderie, then then we're in good shape for learning because everyone's comfortable with each other. That's that's absolutely, that's really wonderful. And especially because um, I think that uh, uh, what you said about um, being heard because uh, often students don't get a chance to be heard um, when they're in a class, because they're, if their class is over 20, um, they're not going to be called on every day, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So, um, and of course, when you're talking about public education in the United States, you get up to 30 or 40 kids um, in a specific class. So as um, head of school, um, what are the programs that you think that most inspire you? I'm sure everything inspires you at your schools, but are there Particular programs, you know, when I think of BIDPAC, for example, um, I think of uh, drama and their mm -hmm. theater program, which has been um, been so uh, glorious. And when I think of um, Iolani, I think there are many good programs, but I think that their math program in particular is uh, is just just out of the, out of this world. And of course, when I think of uh, Punahou, I think of the breadth of what a kid can choose if they go to school there. And I think that your daughter is indeed went to Punahou, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and um, you know, uh, so did mine. Um, but, you know, if I had to do it again, uh, there's a good chance I would have sent uh, my daughters to St. Anne's from what I've seen. Uh, there's a couple. But if I if I look overall, 
I, I think our overarching curriculum is really from preschool to 12th grade is how do you build an individual to help them to lead themselves and if they choose, lead others. And that begins with understanding who you are and then how you might contribute to the world. So in the upper school, we have a global leadership curriculum, which is just outstanding, that helps us focus on the United Nations sustainability goals and asks the girls to actually do projects to actually help the world be better in the way they can. You know, doing something to clean up a, a local stream or you know something that's manageable at the local level. But the other program is, and these kind of all, will, we are woven together because we're so small, um, almost all the programs can are integrated <laughs> into each other. And so, but we have an amazing program that is our college and career counseling program. And it's called Priory in the City. And it's where our 10th and 11th and 12th graders go through a kind of a uncovering of who they are what their strengths are, what their talents are, and then what their interests are. And then they go explore what is what are some of the jobs that might interest them? What are some of the careers they might want to investigate? And then they go to field trips on to see what they're like. Like go to the doc, I want to be an orthopedic surgeon, I'll go visit an orthopedic surgeon. If I want to be a veterinarian, I'll go see a vet. If I want to be a journalist, I'll go to a, a local um, newspaper or something. So we we explore those. And then, then in their senior year, they have a, an internship. So every girl that graduates from the Priory has an internship that is hefty, six to eight weeks, maybe longer, and they have to do a real project for their internship. So they have to, I don't know, make a poster about something or write an article. One gal had to do an animation for a, a local newspaper. And so it was pretty interesting. They learn whether they want to do the career or not. And so uh, we have people that have served for Senator Schatz. We've had people work in the, the downtown uh, law offices, having to write a brief. Writing a brief is tough. <laughs> and so, and then they present that. What, what did I learn? Uh, and now what do I know more about myself and how is this going to impact my next steps? So this is a, a very detailed process, but it, it's so powerful. As part of that process, um, do the girls find out where the best suited college is? And let me tell you why I'm asking this question. Um, often when I you know, read the uh, alumni magazines of a school like Punahou or Iolani, they are proud to mention, you know, their Ivy League uh, components and things like this. And I've always thought to myself, maybe an Ivy League is not suitable um, <laughs> for a given student, or maybe, uh, you know, Stanford is not suitable for a student. And maybe we should tailor make what colleges a student applies for, first of all, based on the parents and the student, but also on the what the student is interested in. Yeah. So that's how we design the program, working from the child's interests, the students' interests, you know, the parents' wishes, always navigating that territory. Uh, but what I found is that uh, our girls are more clear about where they wish to go because they know themselves better and they know what they want so they can make better decisions. So their decision making is better. We also give them the suite of colleges to look through. But to your point, um, a couple of years ago, we had a gal, National Merit Scholar, oh my gosh, just out of this world student, Stanford, Harvard, Yale, all wanted her to go there. And it wasn't a good fit for her. <laughs> and so she's at Pomona and doing extraordinary. And it was the perfect match. Uh, and so we, I agree with you. I think it's about the fit and the match more than the name. But if you can get, if you can get the fit and the match, and it matches their academic level, they can really soar. And you know, um, but because I know a bit about you, and I know that you, uh, uh, your daughters played water polo or were swimmers. <laughs> so, what opportunity are there for the girls? This being such a small uh, school. Um, to play um, organized sports. How do you how do you handle that one? Well, I absolutely love sports, so I wasn't going to let that die here at St. Andrews. <laughs> so we really focus on 
the smaller sports so and the individual sports. So we have um, volleyball and basketball, paddling and air riflery, cross country. And then we allow all our students participate in PAC-5. So if they wanna do soccer or softball, they can then join PAC-5 and, and have that larger experience. And we're doing pretty well. Sometimes we're in Div 3, sometimes we're in Div 2. It just depends on the girls that are traveling through. But our, our intermediate volleyball team is pretty awesome right now. Well, let, let me ask you something. Does, does PAC-5, uh, because I know where your uh, interests lie, does PAC-5 um, uh, have a, a water polo? Uh, yes, they, at least they did in the past. I, I know they did in the past. I don't have any girls interested right now, so I don't know 100% if this year they do. But um, we have had a girl play in the water polo in the past. <laughs> Sometimes PAC-5 adjusts itself. You know, I want to um, go a little bit away from the school and just talk about you in the sense that you as an administrator of the school, you know, we have had um, in Hawaii, we've lucky to have, um, you know, administrators that are just, you know, um, up beyond the pale. Uh, Michael Chan at Kamehameha, uh, David Kuhn at um, Iolani, uh, Rod McPhee and um, Rod McPhee at Punahou and Jim Scott. Um, I mean, uh, you know, heads of school that have been around, you know, that stay for like 25 years, which is unheard of, you know, I guess the average uh, term, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's like five years in independent school. So what have you learned um, as a head of school of a really prominent and wonderful uh, gem in Hawaii? Uh, what are the things that you have learned as a, as a, as a key administrator? And I'm sure that not everything is uh, is easy. Uh, for you on a daily basis, but yet you're faced with a lot of issues. Um, you know, I, I remember that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Scott at Puno was saying, oh my God, there's people coming through my door every five minutes, each with an issue, you know, and that's just one day. So um, I'll stop now and just ask you that question. Well, it's a great question. I've had so many good mentors. So just naming all of them that you just named, they're so wonderful. What I would say is it very much matters how I feel and how I present myself and where the that leadership um, role at the school. And so sometimes that's you have to actually be a steady leader, predictable, <laughs> consistent, <laughs> and and fair and just and humane, everything that our uh, mission and vision say. So I I very much think um, what makes a good leader is listening to the people that are really doing the work, which for the most part are the teachers. The teachers are really uh, under, they're, they're teaching children after COVID. I mean, it's a whole new ball of wax, right? So just trying to figure these things out to just make sure we're listening, but then also have high integrity, be consistent and make sure, you know, you're um, using all the values that we uphold as an institution. You mentioned, um, you know, leaders, and I should, I, you know, I should mention Robert Witt, who is the head of the Hawaiian Association of Independent Schools, who was, I know, a mentor to you, especially yes. when they were in that, in that, um, in that University of Hawaii connected uh, program for master's degrees um, for um, high school administrators. So have there been um, moments um, in your career that you have found uh, particularly tough? And um, how have you dealt with them? You know, if you've had a tough decision, because you're, you know, I mean, unlike, I mean, you were really a CEO. And so all CEOs face tough decisions. And so I wanted to ask you if you've had tough decisions and how you came to uh, deal with those decisions. Well, it's interesting. Uh, I think everyone has tough decisions uh, every day. What I think is the most important and interesting, that's the name of this show, it's really the journey and, and taking uh, the information that you have at a given point in time and doing the best you can with the the material that you have and making sure that you're anticipatory, make sure that you're thinking ahead and that you're not leaving anyone behind 
and that you're thinking of the voices that aren't necessarily in the room. So you have a more global perspective of the situation. So I always, I always think that you have to have a process of thinking through things and that it is a journey. And then at one point in time, though, you have to decide because things happen. And then you have to do the best you can with the material you have. And then if you're wrong, say you're wrong and fix it as fast as possible. <laughs> so. so when I talk to people about you, if it, if it's uh, from your friend, Alan Suimori, who oh. was uh, part of the uh, part of your master's program, or I, I talk to my wife who knows you, um, or I talk to any administrator. What the, the word that always comes up when talking about you as an administrator is measured, oh. uh, that you are measured. And, um, you know, you can see, you know, even when I have talked to you, you know, if I ask you something, you know, there's a pause and you listen to my question to you in terms of your own personal journey, how did you come to this? I mean, because that's an enormously important trait for any CEO um, to be measured. Uh, I come from a very emotionally high-charged Irish family. <laughs> and, so, and I was the oldest girl and I have five siblings and I was in charge a lot. And I learned at a very young age that it did not help if I was in the kerfluffle of emotions. So I learned very young that it was better to just get through those emotions and think more. <laughs> did um, coming to um, St. Andrews, since you mentioned this, I mean, did um, being measured, was there any, because uh, you mentioned about, um, you know, being coming from an Irish family, was there anything about the Catholic Church uh, that made you measured or, um, you know, did you go to church and was that a... Um, was that a source of your measurement and, and things like this? Because, you know, when you go to mass, you have to listen for a great deal of time and you don't talk. And then, you you know, you can go to, um, you know, a confession with the priest and things like this. Did that may help you make you measure? Probably. I was raised Catholic and I very much enjoy the Episcopal faith because it's more open and it has you're allowed to think more. Uh, so I just think that it probably helped a lot uh, more maybe than I even understand. I'm a geologist. So by training, I had to study time. So to me, time is expansive, even though my life is short. Uh, so I also think in time, in terms of geologic time often. That's such a wonderful answer because we had a geologist came because there was uh, um, something wrong with the dirt at our house. And, you know, this guy was talking about, he said, well, you know, in the next thousand years, probably this hill will not be here. And I was thinking to myself, well, I'm not going to be around in the next thousand <laughs> years, but, but that was an interesting comment. I, so I appreciate that. So my last question to you is about balance in mm -hmm. your life, because, you know, you have a wonderful professorial um, husband and you raised, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, three daughters. Uh, two daughters, one son. Oh, sorry. Two daughters, one son. And um, how did you set up your, you know, I mean, not just it being head of school, but before this, you were a minister. How did you set up your life balance um, with paying attention to your children, paying attention to your husband, paying attention to all sorts of other things um, in your life that heads of school have to um, uh, deal with all the time? You know, I've, I've asked that to a lot of different heads of school and um uh, Anyway, I want to ask you that question. Well, it's interesting. I think for me, uh, I have always had a lot of energy. Uh, so I used that energy <laughs> and then did whatever I could. Um, I don't think there's really such a thing as a balanced life. I think you you kind of have this rhythm of life. Oh, September's busy. Okay, don't make any major decisions in December. Oh, June's coming up. Okay, everyone prepared, stock the refrigerator, get your laundry done. You know, like, so there are times in life that are just, yeah, it's too, it's too busy to manage things well. So you just say, hold, <laughs> if possible. Uh, so I, I think that I, I did it more like a ebb and flow. Uh, and then my daughter, one of my daughters told me, mom, when you become head of school, you're going to have to plan your breaks because you won't take any. And so I started to plan my breaks. And so I started to plan. You work out five to six times a week. And I asked my husband to make sure I did it because if I had work to do, I would skip it. 
And so, and he won't let me skip it. So I, I just have, um, I have people around me that know me well, and they're like, yeah, you've got to plan that or you won't, you won't do it. <laughs> so, well, it. I can confirm from, I, I, I can say this fairly, that of all the people that I've had on Journeys of the Mind, it was the most difficult to get you, not because of any uh, problems or anything, but just because you were so bloody busy. <laughs> and so, you know, we would go week for week. And so I'm so happy um, that you're on. And I'm going to leave um, the last word to you, except to mention um, to everyone watching um, uh, this this wonderful program, uh, that um, Journeys of the Mind, that, you know, it, it was a student several years ago um, from your school that won the national, repeat, national Shakespeare Festival. And um, it was because of your teachers and um, et cetera, and the good coaching that uh, this young woman had. And I think she went to the new school in New York or to NYU. Um, and um, you really have, uh, I mean, this is a really um, a, a great thing about um, uh, not only um, St. Andrews, but for, you know, a victory for Hawaii. I mean, people are always talking about people not speaking standard English, untrue, because um, <laughs> people can speak standard English and pidgin. Um, and, you know, your, your student, you know, won the entire Shakespeare Festival sponsored by an English nonprofit, I may add, um, in New York City. So that's that's really uh, quite remarkable. And I'm going to leave the last word to you. Any last words about your wonderful gem of schools or well, gems of schools? I want to thank you first for inviting me. Uh, it's been really a pleasure to talk to you. And uh, it was enjoyable. And I also would say that um, we have excellent teachers. We have excellent students. And I think we set the conditions where children can thrive and grow and be better than they expected because we can see what's good inside of them. So that's we're a, a great school. And I'm really proud to be the head of school at St. Andrews. There we go. President and head of school at St. Andrews Schools, Dr. Ruth Fletcher. And, you know, the schools are gems and um, she is like one of the best uh, heads of schools in the United States. So I hope you had an enjoyable time listening to Dr. Fletcher and a hui ho. That's it for Carl Ackerman and Journeys of the Mind. Mahalo. Mm -hmm.